What is up, Dodger Nation? Today, it is a very special day on the Blue Heaven Podcast because we are joined by a former Cy Young winner, a former World Series champion, three-time All-Star, two-times Rolades Reliever of the Year Award winner. He is one of the greatest closers to ever grace the mound at Dodger Stadium. He is Mr. Eric Gagne. Eric, number one, how are you? Number two, what have you been up to lately? Uh, I'm really good, actually. Uh, obviously, I didn't get a haircut in a while, so... <laughs> But I'm doing good. I'm doing really good. I mean, I'm just trying to keep busy working out. I'm here in my little dungeon. That's my, uh, I got a mount in the back. So I keep throwing, just keeping busy, trying to stay away as much as possible. And uh, just, I'm lucky I'm in Arizona. So I got good weather. My kids are in Montreal. They're stuck inside. So it's kind of a little harder, but it's been good. I've been, you know, stay positive and just wait till it gets better a little bit, I guess. I know. I like the, I like the show flow, man. It, it really does look good. I think it it's conducive to the time. So, you know, that's, I, that's, that seems to be the way people are proving that they're staying indoors. It's through the hair. So I don't know about Brooks haircut these days, but um, yeah, right off yeah, the man. bat, right off the bat, uh, I, I think, you know, Brooke and I were talking about this and we've talked a lot, a lot about it of, of late, but you're somebody who's has such a long history with the Dodgers. And of course, have i'm assuming just thousands of of great tommy lasorda stories but having just lost tom uh we wanted to just get your feelings on that maybe share your your favorite lasorda story and uh you know kind of where you're at with that well tommy was the first dodger i've ever even went in touch with he was actually when i signed with the dodgers it or in montreal olympic stadium and he showed me the curveball with his crooked finger and I mean, there's so many stories. And the, the funny thing, I was well, looking on social media today and uh, I was reading about Clayton Kershaw, what he said about his story over and over and over and over. And it's so true how he made everybody make, make them feel part of the Dodgers. And I believe blue. I'm always going to believe blue. And the reason why is because it's because of Tommy. And Tommy was just a cert, such a presence, such a, such a Dodger ambassador. And, you know, not just Dodger, just baseball ambassador in general, just his love for the game, his love for – just being out there and competing is pretty impressive. And uh, I send my wife a text. I'm like, it's pretty weird that a grown man cried for another grown man when I heard the news. And uh, she goes, it's normal. I mean, he was basically my baseball father, basically. You know, it's pretty special because, you know, I, I am laughing because he made me laugh all the time. And I think that's what we need to remember. Tommy is going to miss a lot, but he made he made baseball amazing in California. He made me a baseball. He made me a Dodger blue guy. And I think that's that's all I can say. He's just one of a kind and he's just going to be missed like crazy. But, you know, he had a great life. And I think we need to celebrate his life, what he's done for us, what he's mm -hmm. done for Dodger Nation and what he's done for baseball in general is pretty special. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, kind of echo on that. And I've, I've talked about it a lot over the last, uh, you know, well, now about a week. Um, one of my favorite stories or favorite interviews have come from uh, Andre Ethier. And hearing you say the same thing, like the same narrative, you guys weren't managed by Tommy Lasorda, but you still have that, that, that Dodger blue, that legacy and doctrine in you, probably mostly because of Tom Lasorda. So um, I'm kind of curious your thoughts on that, like just seeing the way the game is now and 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 knowing particularly the way the Dodgers are I mean there is that history there is that legacy that that the Dodgers do carry uh but it's not going to be the same without Tommy um what do you think like what is something maybe you know some of the guys some of you guys uh that know those stories know the the legacy of the Dodgers how how can you kind of continue that on with some of the younger classmen what I think what he's done is just implemented a, uh, I'd say like a, not a lifestyle, but just a, a, a culture. A culture is what every team wants. I mean, you're, I play, I was actually coached for the Rangers. I coach, I mean, I was with the Dodgers. I was lucky enough where I was part of two really, really huge franchise, Boston and uh, LA. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that. I mean, you don't really, you don't understand what culture is unless you're in that culture and the Dodger bleeding blue. And we talked about Dodger nation, Red Sox nation. This is pretty impressive what they get. It takes a long time. And it's not just Tommy, it's the whole history. And Tommy knew that history. I mean, Tommy played in Montreal. I'm from Montreal. He played in Montreal. You know, it's pretty, uh, he's touched every single aspect of the game. And Tommy was just embody of this, uh, just a baseball Dodger blue. I mean, it's, it's going to keep living on forever. Whoever Do Tommy touched, whoever Tommy had meal with, 
he's became instant Dodger fan, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just the more we talk about Tommy, the better it's going to be. And it, it's going to be because he is Dod he is the Dodgers. They lost yeah. the heart and soul. And, you know, I think it's going to live on forever, but it's a big, big piece to swallow to, to lose. It's a big, it's a hard thing to do. I think the fans, you know, we have Vince Scully that's going to be there for us to remind us of this. And it's pretty special. Vin, you had Tommy, I mean, we had Don Newcomb, all these guys, mm -hmm. you know, all the, the Dodger greats, the Dodger blue guys. And to me, I was just a little bit piece of it for a little bit of that. But I mean, it took me, I mean, it took my heart. It took my heart. The Dodgers took my heart. And I think Tommy was a big part of that. Yeah, Eric, obviously you talked about also playing for the Red Sox. So two very storied history franchises. And obviously you get a World Series with the Red Sox. Um, coming off of a 2020 season in which the Dodgers, you know, we finally get over that edge. We finally get over that 1988 hump. You were on a few pretty good uh, Dodgers teams. Didn't quite get out, get to the World Series, but what was your reaction to it? Did, was there at any point where you were looking at it like, oh, they might be out of this? Because I know for me, <laughs> when they were down three games to one, it was kind of kind of tough for me to to feel good about it. Uh, not really. I think it's just like every day, every game, you're so part of it. You're so part of every single out. I mean, I was watching every game. I was, I was trying to guess what Dave Roberts moves going to be. I was trying to, you know, try to put it all pieces all together, being, you know, at home, try everything I do is second guess is great. And, uh, you know, it's, it, I was with them in the heart and it's soul and in, in thoughts. And I was there. I mean, I felt like I won the world series with them. And I think that's what everybody, every player that played in that team, feel like when they won, I wish I would have won there. I mean, that's just the one thing I wish in my career. There's not a lot of regrets I have. I mean, the winning Wall Series of the Red Sox was amazing. I, I didn't do good there. So it was really rewarding to get that ring and be with a great group of guys. And But not winning with Dodger Blue, that's what hurt me the most in my career. I, was, I, you know, I kept coming back for coaching a little bit, trying to get that little piece. But I was there. I helped the guys there. So that for me, that just gives me a little bit of a – you know, for me, I feel like I was part of that ring. I don't know what people think of, and I don't really yeah. care about that. I just, it makes me proud. It makes me proud to be a guy, a shot. I took golfing when he was young. He won. <laughs> Maybe I made a little bit of an impact there. You know, just stuff like that, that makes me, makes me proud to be a Dodger. And, you know, I'm a World Series champion with a Dodger too. So that's how I feel it's it's funny uh, not long after you know we we had our live stream about you know celebrating the world series win and uh you know the, there was a lot of people throwing names out there of like who deserves a ring from this that wasn't a part of the team you know i you keep getting you get your russell martins in there you you do see a few Gagne's, even though it's it's the old school uh you know the ethier types who were obviously robbed in 2017 and uh, i i, I got to give props to you because i remember around this time or a little bit after last year you uh kind of tearing into the ass Astros for for what they did to the game so 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 thank you for that Dodger fans really do appreciate that I think baseball fans appreciate that um uh I'll I'm gonna stick on that vein so you're, you're one I of think, the you know, I want to add I want to add a little something about okay. the 2017 I did rip it a little bit but to me uh, that much sweeter they had to work that much harder to get it and I mm -hmm. think it's, you know, we can look back and do the, you know what, the Dodgers are world champion this year. And it's yeah. pretty amazing. And with that year, that crazy year that we've had, it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. I think it's, 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 it's perfect. I mean, the Dodgers won the world series in 2020. I think 2019 wouldn't have been the same as 2020 and mm -hmm. 2017 wouldn't be the same either. So I think it's pretty cool that they have it. They earned it. They earned it more than, you know, they earned it. That's the beauty of it. And that's yeah. what I think they're, and they're in line for winning maybe another one next year and a year after. That's why yeah. I think, the Dodgers, like we talk about Dodger Nation, Dodger, like the bleeding blue, they, there's a lot to be excited about because these guys, what they've done, what they built, and it, it is Dodger blue team. And, you know, there's a couple of years that we kind of went away a little bit from Dodger blue, we went away a little from the, but it goes back. I mean, the culture doesn't go, doesn't leave because the, if the, the, the base and the solid the foundation are there, everybody reverts back. And I think that's what the Dodgers done. That's why I think it's going to live on for a long time. That's what Tommy has done. He was able yeah. to yeah. bring everything back, go back to basic was Dodger blue and they got back and they won as Dodger blue. And it's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you're seeing so many fantastic arms. Uh, the Dodger tradition has always been uh, elite pitching and that legacy continues. That lineage continues here um, as somebody who was, you know, the game has, has changed a lot from, from when you were, you were, uh, you know, K and everybody in the world. Um, what are your thoughts just on like the modern game, the analytics and, and, you know, the spin rate and how important that stuff has become. And, and when does it come back to just, you know, 
chucking a ball uh, into the glove and getting people out. <laughs> <laughs> it's still the same. I think we just kind of use different words. We use numbers. I think it's if you really sit down and understand the numbers, which I love now. I mean, I love mm -hmm. numbers, but they're just numbers. I think the the beauty of baseball is those those variables, the human factor. You know, it's not black and white. We all know that. If we watch the game, it's not black and white. It's gray. There's a lot of yeah. gray is the variables, the decision making process, and what's going to happen <laughs> with certain guys. You know, this is what's beauty of the base of the game. And I think we emphasize. I think the problem is not just in data, it's in analytic. It's more of how we look at it. If you look mm -hmm. at it as a pure game, yeah, there's a lot of variables you can add, like oh, spin rate and everything else. That doesn't matter much because spin rate was there before. Yeah. There's no difference. Now we just right. put numbers on it, and that's all it is. It's just a tool to use. You just utilize that tool for coaches, for players to see, okay, where am I at when I perform the best? It has changed, but it's okay. It's a, it, it needs to change. It's all evolving, and that's okay. It's okay to yeah. change. As long as you don't lose the base, as long as you don't lose the beauty of this game is the human nature, the human factor, the, the little decision-making we have to make in certain situations. Because there's no way I can predict the game because it wouldn't be the same game. It wouldn't, we just it wouldn't play it. Yeah. And I think that's defense focus on that. I think it's been thrown at people and there's a way it could have been done a little bit better where it could have been more of a, and like more teach the fans, teach the players. I think the players retracted too. the players. Mm -hmm. It was utilized against the players and this and that. And I think in a whole grand scheme of thing, data analytics is very good for the game. If you use it the right way. Yeah, well, so I think that's a really important part of it. And I think that's uh, sometimes something that's often missed in Major League Baseball today. But when it's used in the right way, um, I like uh, the way, just the way you phrase it, as long as you keep your base and uh, it's just <laughs> used as a tool to add to the game, not to take away from it. Um, and not necessarily just completely throwing it out the window. Like, no, I'm an old school baseball player. Forget about the spin rate. Forget about the analytics. Let's just throw the ball. <laughs> it's a tool. It's a, it's yeah. a tool at the player's for the players, for the fans, and for the, the coaches. And if you don't utilize it, though, you're missing out. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I can throw a ball 55 times in a row and just throw it. Yeah, I get the feel for it, but if I don't know what it is and why, you know, if I can make an adjustment in one or two pitches by looking at the data, well, why not? You know what I mean? That's yeah. just wear and tear that I don't need to use. So I think if you use it the right way, if you understand, okay, there is variables. I'm a human factor. And someday I fact through three or four days in a row, my arm is different. I might not have the same spin rate, but it doesn't mean I can't be effective. Mm -hmm. So these are adjustments that need to be made with players and with staff, with, with the teams. I think it got taken a little bit out of context, a little too, too hardcore mm -hmm. one side, but it's, it's going to balance out. It always does. I mean, everything that, everything that's new is great. And then you're like, okay, it's not as great as I thought. <laughs> and then let's take that and really go old school, new school. I don't like to say old school, new school, but it's just another tool. It's just all it is is another tool. And if we use it to impact the game for the players, for the fans, it's, it's good. And you just got to utilize it the right way. Well said. Uh, Eric, I'm going to ask you something a little controversial just because it's in the news headlines over the past couple of weeks. There was a, an Angels employee that came out and talked about pitchers using foreign substances on baseballs and things like that. And that kind of led to a – us going down the rabbit trail a little bit. And uh, there was a couple articles where they were talking about major league baseball testing out kind of pre sticky balls and, uh, instead of, you know, mud rubbed and things like that, that kind of played in the favor so that they wouldn't have to use a foreign substance on a ball to, because I understand, you know, when it's cold and you're trying to grip a baseball, yeah. it's almost impossible. And that's a big justification for pitchers nowadays where they're like, look, man, you want me to drill somebody in the ribs with hundred miles an hour? Or do you want me to be able to throw it in the strike zone? Because, if a batter gets a pine tar on their bat, I should be able to at least help some give, uh, have something to help me throw a baseball straight. Um, kind of just wondering where you stand on that, because in terms of recency, there's obviously been a lot of players who have talked about like, yeah, it's, it's a pretty widely accepted thing in baseball right now. Yeah. There is a technically a rule against it, but it's That's that gray area. Accepted. Like, like Eric, yeah. like you're talking about that sort of that gray area. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I actually did use those balls and I love it. The hitters uh -huh. don't like it as much, right? But it's just, it's a, a like I said, a, as long as it's done for the safety and for the greater of the game, that's all I care about. I mean, does it give an advantage? Yeah, but do you want to get hit in the head in Colorado and then I go to Florida? That's a totally different ball. So mm -hmm. if they give me the consistency of the ball, I know exactly where I'm getting to Colorado or where I'm getting to Florida because there is, I mean, I'm throwing a hundred mile an hour ball at someone I'm trying to go in. And now every time you go in, there's, you know, so there's got to be a final, there's got to be a discussion there to, hey, you don't have to, just, doesn't I mean it's cheating? Right. Maybe mm -hmm. it's improving my, you know, improving my dexterity, whatever, whatever it is, especially now with the younger guys coming up, throwing fuel. I mean, they're throwing hard and they throw a lot less strikes. So it's like, all right, what are we, are we trying to for safety? 
if we bring it for safety for the greater game, everybody's going to be in. It's just right. how you phrase it. And I think if it, you know, the pine tar, I mean, if you put pine tar all the way on it, is this legal? No, I mean, it's going to give you, if you hit the ball hits a pine tar, but actually if you put pine tar on the ball, the ball is going to stick more to the bat. It's going to go farther. So, all right, we can go back and forth mm -hmm. on this, but I think if, if it's done the right way, if it's done, if it's explained to the players, to the hitters first, because I think the hitters going to be have a big say in this, and right. then the fans understand. Hey, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. We're not. It's not going to be perfect with all the new rule change and everything. It's never been perfect. There's always going to be players or fans complaining. But if it's done the right way, if it's explained, right, we're trying to get to where we're not going to hit someone in the head. Or we're trying to get to where the ball is consistently the same, so the guys, the players, have consistent feel on the ball so they don't hurt someone. I think it's this game that if it's explained that way, of course, there's guys going to take it, try to take it the other way. It's like, Oh, more spin, more curveball, more this and that. Right. It's just going to, it's the nature of the game. Everybody's trying to get a little bit of an edge. So you just have to make sure that you, you know, you police yourself too. I mean, the players mm -hmm. understand that. And I think the players want the integrity of the game to stay the same and to make sure that we, we take care of that. And if it's by making the balls a little, a little tackier for safety of the players, I think if you phrase it that way, it's going to be accepted. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think uh, if you had told me you get to stand in the box against Eric Gagne on a cold day, uh, you want to let him use something grippy, I think I'd probably say, yeah, because I don't want that 100-mile-an-hour fastball <laughs> up in my rib cage. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit here. Obviously, Brooke and I are, are longtime Dodger fans and uh, huge fans of, of the Gagne era, uh, era. I think there was no better time uh, I stand behind this. There was no better time than that era. You coming into the game, this, the loudspeakers, everything that the, the excitement of that, you know, the, we've had the Dodger fans have the narrative arrive late, leave early. You didn't in 2002, 2003, when you were killing it, 2004, that uh, was some of the best Dodger baseball. And uh, you get that playoff experience and the fun of that. So we want to fan out a little bit. We want to have some fun. We want to let the fans know a little bit more about Eric Gagne. Uh, what was your favorite player growing up? My favorite player was Roger Clemens, actually. I just liked the way he was in. He held himself on the mound. Yeah, just, just total domination. He was mm -hmm. on the mound. He became a monster. He became yeah. something that it was just a presence. And I think for yeah. me, I got a lot of that. So I've seen a lot of this. And uh, Tim Wallach, Tim Wallach was one of my favorite players because as an expo, I was a big <laughs> fan of his. Tim Wallach and I think uh, Gary Carter, these guys are probably my favorite players of all time. Tim Raines, I'm a huge expo guy. So, yeah. but I mean, if you look at it, I think Roger Clemens was my biggest influence. The way I think the way I approach the game, my the way I carry myself on the mound, look like I'm going to dominate you. It's yes. kind of where I was going with. And that's kind of my, my, you know, my, uh, kind of who I looked at a little bit for me to like straight straight. Just, I might not dominate you with a mm -hmm. pitch, but I will dominate you mentally. And I'll try to show you that I'm going to take you somehow. I'm going to kick your butt. You know, you say that, and that was a glass shattering moment right there because I see it, you know, you're, you're one of those guys, they have that, that, that one dude who emulates uh, the people with the, the batting stance, the batting stance guy. I I've always uh, liked to, to kind of mess around with, you know, pitchers and whatever you you've been one of my go-tos for a long time. Obviously it doesn't look the same <laughs> coming from me, but uh, yeah, you, you see that. And I think you, the game has kind of gone away from that as well. Like that, that gritty, like that Mike Fetters style, whatever, you know, you're, yep. you're on the mound. I want to make you feel scared. Right. So uh, you did it. You, I think you nailed uh, the, the, the rocket impersonation uh, for your career, man. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a, go ahead. Go. Sorry. Go ahead. I just think it's just an attitude, you know, I think mm -hmm. it's, you get on the mound and I think, you know, everybody's very talented, but if you have that little bit of it, like you talk about trying to get an edge somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I thought that if I could show that I'm going to dominate you, even if I don't, if I showed, I will, and I'm going to keep going, coming after you, I think it was a little bit of an advantage. I kind of, I'm not even like that off the mound too. It's a more of a, like when I got on a mound, that was my, my that's my mound. That's my office. This is the only place I'm comfortable. I can just go crazy and be someone I'm, you know, I'm not kind of like that in life, but not that, aggressive mm -hmm. so that's pretty funny i used to meet guys on people in the street they're like oh i thought you're super mean i'm like <laughs> i'm just throwing baseballs <laughs> i'm not gonna beat people up <laughs> you, you, got, you got to remind them that you're still canadian so you know you're still very nice guy <laughs> i'm assuming you also, <laughs> i'm assuming you also got a lot of where are the goggles at on the street at least then yeah <laughs> anyway oh yeah <laughs> go ahead brooke um, yeah, uh, I guess, uh, going off of that a little bit, what do you have a particular favorite Dodgers moment that stands out to you? 
Yeah, I mean, the, my favorite, so we all talk about my streak and everything, 84 in a row, but my favorite moment was when I got off that streak and then I went off and fans stood up for me. I blew a save. And that, to me, that was like, I'm like, this is my, th these are my fans. This is my wow. family. This is, I mean, they all, usually it would be like, you know, it would have been like, yeah, oh, good job and everything else. But then <laughs> I came on the bench. I got, first of all, I got a standing ovation for blowing a save. <laughs> and I had to keep my composure because it was a tight game. So I kept yeah. the game tight. And that's what I'm really proud of. Like on all these saves, all my blown saves, I, I'm not sure if I'm 100% accurate on that, but all of them, I got tight game. And I came back and, of course, Adrian Beltre hit a home run <laughs> to win the game. So Belly picked me up. So it was just a perfect day. I think it was a perfect time. When I blew the save, the fans stood up. I blew it in the Dodger Stadium, which was amazing because I got the standing ovation from the fans. And then Beltre came through for me and, we won the game, so it was a perfect day in a blown save situation. No balls and two strikes. Gonzalez, the tying run at second with one out. Five for Dodgers, ninth inning. Big chopper, signs can't get it, deflects it by Cora. Here comes Gonzalez to score. So there it is for Eric Gagne. He had a lead, a save opportunity, and it goes down the drain. His last blown save, August 26th, and the crowd stands up, and well, they should. He deserves a standing ovation for an unbelievable streak. So Hillenbrand got that hanging curve. That was unlike Gagne. Gonzalez doubles, and now Tracy hits one off signs glove, deflected by Cora, and the time run is scored. Worth another look. Ground ball, signs has it get away, and then it goes behind Cora. So Eric Gagne comes back to join the rest of us mere mortals, at least for the moment. He surrenders two to tie up the game. Remarkable. Doesn't get much better than that. That's the <laughs> ultimate standing go right there. It's like, guys, hey, so you know I messed up, right? <laughs> uh, on that, that was one of the questions we kind of had in the back of our head. Uh, what was the closest during that streak that you ever felt like, uh, uh, this is it, I'm going to lose it today? There's a lot of times. I mean, you remember, I remember in Montreal where I wasn't supposed to pitch. I went out. We had a day game. And it was a tight game. I went in the game. I was a little bit under the weather, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sean Green threw a guy out on home plate. Oh, and, I remember that one, yeah. Um, in Montreal, one skip, perfect. And then there's another time when Lance Bergman hit a changeup center field. Dave Roberts, back then, they had, that was in Houston, had those Godzilla. poles. Dave Roberts, oh, yeah. like all of his three foot eight went over, <laughs> went over the fence and got it. I'm like, man, that's insane. So there's a lot of things, like there's a lot of those that happen where, I mean, there's a lot of luck. I mean, yeah. I was just at the right place at the right time. Yeah, I was throwing the ball well. And all my, so everybody's like, oh, you're so dominant. I'm like, my misses were missed. That's mm -hmm. the only difference. Like, I wasn't doing anything more than I was, I was locked. I was in the zone. I'm not going to lie to you. Mm -hmm. And I was executing a lot of pitches, but I made mistakes. I mean, it wasn't perfect, mm -hmm. but those mistakes, I had either guys behind me. I mean, you got to remember the defense, the defense guys I had behind me. I had a great defensive group yeah, there. I mean, we right. had great guys and they just made plays. And I think it's just, it just, it worked out perfectly. It was amazing. Yeah. Because that, that lo I love that streak because as a preserve, I was preserving a win. I never mm -hmm. saw it as a save thing. It was more like, all right, they work eight innings. And that's why I pride myself. It was a, win, a team thing. It was a team stats for me. You know, the, you look at like, uh, they always say in a no hitter in a perfect game, you have that one play and, and you had it, you had a n number of them throughout that streak. And, you know, I, I appreciate the, the call out to the defense because back then you look at, it, you got Beltre, you got Cora, you got Asturis, you got Dave Robertson center field, or, you know, early on with Marquise Grissom and some of those guys, like you had some killer D behind you for sure. And, and, you know, at, at that time too, Paul Duca was top of his game, Dave Ross was top of their game. Um, yeah, <laughs> given the Cesar Asturias, yeah, Cesar Asturias, Alex Score, Beltre, Greedy yeah. at first and out. I mean, yeah. we had a lot of good players. That's why, like, you know, Dodgers is a good foundation, pitching mm -hmm. and defense. We've yep. always had that, and it's always going to be there. And I think, you know, I got lucky because I was thrown in that mix where I was making pitches. I was on top of my game, but then the guys behind me were on top of the game. So it was a perfect, it's a perfect storm. Yep.
Yeah, absolutely. One heck of a team. It's good to, it's good to hear these names <laughs> Oops, again. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like hearing, uh, it reminds me when I was like a kid and watching you guys on like KCAL nine and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> is there a pinnacle of your career? Is there a big moment? Is it, is it the world series championship? Uh, the pinnacle of my career, I would say, no, it's making the playoffs. When uh, I think when we made the playoffs, I really thought we we're going to win the World Series. And I think when Chuck, or not Chuck, when uh, Steve hit the home run, Steve Finley hit the home mm-hmm. run against the Giants, I'm like, all right, there we go. And I think <laughs> I felt so proud to be a Dodger, be in the playoffs, and have a chance to win the World Series with the Dodgers. And, uh, you know, that was probably the pinnacle of my career like that day. And I gave everything I had that year. And, you know, my arm was a little bugged me a little bit, but that was, that was pretty much the top. Winning the World Series was amazing. Mm-hmm as a team thing, but I think personally it was gratifying because I was a Dodger forever. I came in with the Red Sox. They already had an amazing team. So I was kind of a, kind of just a adopted son with the, with the Red Sox <laughs> too. So I, I didn't feel like I fit in perfectly, but it took mm. me a while, but they're amazing. I'm not bashing on I'm just saying like, it was a little bit different than being with the Dodgers getting the right. playoffs. All right. A hard question probably here. Uh, who's your favorite teammate of all time? Of all time? Hmm. I got a lot. I mean, Beltre. It can't be Beltre. There's no way. I mean, Beltre, Coro. Uh, I mean, there's so many. I mean, so many. We had good teams. That's the thing. I was part of great teams, not just, you know, not just result-wise. We had good guys. And I think that's what that's what I think the Dodgers have been, you know, again, we're going back on the culture. I think that's what mm-hmm. Dodgers always put a great team, not just talent-wise. I think just character. They always had great characters. And I think that's, you know, when they start going down a little bit, that's when their down character is going down a little bit. And now they're back up because you see character. You guys, uh, the guys that you have there, the Bellinger, I just saw Bellinger a couple of days ago. These guys are just warriors, man. They go out there. They care about the team and they go out there every single day. And they're a group. They're a group that make each other better. And I think it was part of that. And that, you know, that was kind of, but Beltre, no one in the world could say anything bad about Adrian. I mean, there's nothing <laughs> yeah. you could say bad no. about him. He's just a quality human being. I mean, we, uh, me and the old lady, we still watch Beltre highlights on YouTube and, and we will never tire of Adrian Beltre. Surefire first ballot Hall of Famer right there. Uh, you spent a long time in the big leagues. What was your most big league moment in, in your lifetime or in your career? Uh, big league moment. Like, you mean like, uh, I thought I'm like, I arrived, I'm in the big leagues. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's that there's like, yeah, that first aha moment. There's uh, I mean, hell there could be somebody you blowing somebody off. Like, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's so many different ways I you think, can interpret it. <laughs> well, my first, uh, I'll just go like my first big league moment where I really felt like I've arrived. is when I got to the, play, the all-star game and then we had mm-hmm. to do signing all the balls in my first all-star game. We had like seven hours of balls. So I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess I've done some good. And I think that was like, okay, I've, I've done great things here. And that was my first all-star. So I think that was my first big league moment where I realized I was pretty good at what I was doing. Yeah. I'm assuming your hands probably a little bit tired after that as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. That's why I blew my save. Yeah, there you go we'll I always talk on one blown save in the middle was an all-star game in uh, I think it was in oh, Chicago oh yeah that's right uh-huh. all right well now we have a reason for it now we yeah. have an excuse for it we got it uh there Eric my my first Dodger game my very first Dodger game I got to hear welcome to the jungle blare over the the sound system at Dodger Stadium I was kind of young didn't know what the hell was going on when it was happening all I knew that was people were losing their minds and everyone was very very excited so I got to ask you, I mean, what role does that song play in your life today? Are you going to the grocery <laughs> store listening to Welcome to the Jungle or what are you doing? <laughs> you know what? Truck, it's, going to it still gives me a lot of goosebumps. It, it really does. And every morning I wake up, I love hip hop. I listen to hip hop. I listen to everything. But when rock and roll comes in and Guns N' Roses, I never started myself. It always kind of goes on autoplay and it comes in and it just gives me goosebumps. It reminds me of. You know, I had 84 in a row and I had all those three years that was amazing. And I never almost, I, I don't think I turned down a, the ball once. Mm-hmm. And I was really proud of that. And to me, I never asked for a day off and I was proud of that. And the reason why is because he had Guns N' Roses and the fans behind it. Gave me all the best drug in the world was adrenaline. <laughs> and the fans gave it to me for, for, you know, every time I was at Dodger Stadium. And people ask you, how does it feel? I'm like, I'm not sure I can explain it. It's like getting shot with adrenaline every time right. mm-hmm. you go in the game. And there's 60,000 fans going crazy. And there's nothing like it. I can't even, I can't even go there because it's almost unexplainable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my dad saw it. My mom saw it. My brother saw it. My fam- a lot of my friends saw it. And they can't even describe. They're just like, oh, it's amazing. 
And that's all we can say. It's amazing. It really was amazing. It was just goosebumps and I couldn't feel a thing. I was on the mound, just straight, pure adrenaline. My arm was hanging and I didn't care. I'm like, I'm going to go out there as much as I can and as hard as I can. And I think that's what it represents me. It just represents all the hard work, the fans, the mm -hmm. fans trying to encourage me every single day. It just reminds me of the fans. It reminds me when I was sitting there and I would get up, just get out of that little box that we have in there in the, in the dugout. I mean, in the bullpen, yeah. walk out of there, the fans would get up. I mean, all right, I can't. I got to be on my game. These guys are watching me warm up. And it was just a matter of time if I get in and it just, they just took me and carried me to the mound, basically. And when I was on the mound, it just took me to another level. Yeah. Uh, and, and that era, man, you were a model of consistency. You're talking about, you never turned on the ball. I think you had what, like three years in a row where you had like exactly what 77 and a third innings pitch or something like that, which mm -hmm. at that time, when you're, you're striking out over a hundred guys in that, it's like, okay, something's working right. And, and we know it's the adrenaline. We know there's so much went well. And uh, man, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. We don't want to take a lot of your time today. We appreciate you, you know, just kind of, going with the gambit of weird crap we, we asked you, man. Uh, so I like it. <laughs> what, what comes next now for, for Eric Gagne? Uh, just baseball training and working out, working with some young guys. I mean, I've always had guys at the house. My wife's getting a little sick of it. So now, <laughs> now since COVID hit, we haven't had anybody. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not good, but it's, it gives yeah. her a little break. She knows it's right. going once that comes down a little bit. Guys come to the house, just training with them. Like I love, I still love to throw. I love, mm -hmm. I throw every day. I just kind of the new training, the new, the new ways of training. I, I did the drive line for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I did this. I, did, I tried everything, every single training out there. I just trying to do it, implement for my coaching and just keep growing, keep learning stuff from baseball. I think, you know, baseball is in my blood. It's always going to be. And I think, you know, when I don't know what to do, I just look at baseball. And I'll find something to do. We're going to get that late, uh, that late uh, or mid forties uh, comeback from you, man. No chance. I've learned my lesson. It hurts too much. <laughs> Respect. Maybe the Olympics. Maybe the Olympics. Okay. Two weeks, I can do two weeks. You heard okay. it here first, folks. Confirmed to the Olympics, <laughs> Eric Kanye. Eric, man, we appreciate it. maybe. <laughs> right. For maybe. It's a, it's a hard maybe. We appreciate the time, man. Uh, stay healthy. And, uh, you know, thank you for doing this. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. It was fun.